Event Horizon, the novelization of the film by Stephen E. MacDonald. Chapter 43. My ship, we thought, walking through the darkness, my rules. The Event Horizon had its hooks in his heart. He knew that. He refused to accept the possibility that his wishes could be irrational. Far from it. In fact, his desires were in accordance with those of USAC to retrieve the ship and resolve the mystery. Miller was a madman, driven by a terror of the dark. He had no way of knowing what had happened there, what that bizarre log entry meant. For all Miller knew, or could know, the log entry had been of an elaborate fake, hidden behind a blind of signal noise. On the basis of this, Miller was willing to destroy the event horizon. Billions of dollars had gone into the project, along with the millions of man-hours and astonishing amounts of resources. He walked through the darkness of the first containment, into the separator tube. The sections spun around him, their vibrations feeding through his body. He had poured his life into this vessel, had dedicated the lives of many others to its development and construction. It would seem that the lives of its first crew had been sacrificed in the course of its maiden voyage, lost in the headlong rush of some kind of madness. The event horizon had been a story of blood and pain, his blood, his pain. Once she had vanished, he had been nothing, had had nothing, except Claire. Once she was gone, he had become a dead man. Walking through the days, one day his body would have caught up with his mind, and he would simply have stopped, shutting down like an obsolete piece of equipment. The USAC had not been willing to fund another grand experiment in Starflight, not without knowing just why the first one accumulated in tremendous and embarrassing failure, without even basic telemetry to show for it. He could not give them answers. They would not give him another chance. In the end, it had been people like Jack Hollis who had kept him going. The return of the event horizon had been his resurrection. He was not going to walk away and die again, spending his days as a zombie until his heart ceased beating. He walked past the abandoned CO2 scrubber case. Incurious, let Miller do what he would. He passed into the second containment, passing an open service duct. Unable to recall if he had closed up the one he had been in. Perhaps not, it did not matter anyway, not now. What mattered now was completing the jump, proving the point. He walked down towards the core. He stopped, staring, his mind working without formulating anything. Oh no, whispered dismayed. Peters. Even in the gloom, he recognised her. She seemed to have fallen from a great height, considering the way her body was twisted. He looked up, seeing an open service access overhead, one that would have been accessible from the magnetic containment generator bay. He went down to her, crouched down, tried to figure out what he should do. Her eyes were open, black as a result of the fall, and she was not breathing. There was a lot of blood, a lot of damage, and he doubted that she had lived long after the impact, if she had survived the fall at all. Peters had been kind to him, he had no friends in this world, and he was always grateful for a little kindness here and there. She had shown him that. He grieved for her son back on Earth. He stood up, looking down at Peters' body, wondering if he should report this immediately or let it pass. Miller would blame him either way. Billy, a familiar voice whispered. Slowly, unwilling, he looked up. Claire was standing before the core, a pale reflection with eyes of milk. Her hair hung around her as though immersed in water. She was naked, water dripping from her, and she was radiant with cold. Weir stared, his eyes widening. Reality blinked and time turned upon its head. She lay on the bed, sapped of energy, drained of vitality, unable to function any longer. She stared at the wall. She had stared at the wall for hours. He could have gotten her off the station if he had wanted, taken her down to Star Skyhawk 1 and into the real light of day. He was dead, though, and he had no compassion for her condition, because she could not have saved him from the doom imposed upon him. We looked frantically around. They were back on Daylight Station, back in his past. He turned back to her. Claire, he said, but the reaction he had hoped for was not there. He walked towards the bed, towards her. 
Claire, it's Billy. I'm home. He reached out. Reality blinked and there was a sound of water running. He turned his head. Claire stood in the bathroom, brushing her teeth with methodical strokes. He glanced back at the bed, but it was empty, unmade, unwashed. He had hardly been there, working himself into a stupor as he tried to solve the mystery of the event horizon without the resources he needed. These were moments in time. He could not change them. He knew that. He knew all of the theoretical physics behind the laws of the immutability of time. He had bent space between his hands, but time had mastered him. He walked towards her, reaching out. I know I wasn't there for you, he said softly, slowly, despising his sudden flood of platitudes, hating himself with each word, angry at a universe that could be so cruel as to do this to him. I'm sorry. I'll let my work come between us. But I'm here now. I'm here. If you could just let me hold you. I've been... Reality blinked. Sweeping away his words, his thoughts, sickening him in the transition. His pulse raced and he felt the surge of adrenaline. Time was sliding beneath him. There was no time. Claire sat on the closed toilet, carefully shaving her legs with his straight razor. Her strokes fine and even. She had been always good at that, teasing him in the early days when he worried that she would cut herself. Time was moving and he was growing frantic. If she could hear him, if he could touch her, stop her, anything... Claire, please don't do this, he said, trying to make her hear. She carried on, oblivious. We don't have to stay here. We can go somewhere else. Gentle stroke after gentle stroke, wanting to look her best. He should have done this. Should have said these words to her. Should have taken the actions that would have made a difference. Earth was not the best place to live, but it would have been better than this. Another place, anywhere you want to go. Just don't do this. I've been so... Reality blinked and he swayed on his feet, trying to keep up, trying to make it stop. More water was running, a bathtub filling with steaming water. She sat by the tub as it filled, idly testing the water with her fingers. Oh God, Claire, no, he screamed. But she did not hear him, could not see him. He seemed to be watching through glass, unable to go far enough to have an effect. I'm pleading with you, please, please don't. Tears streamed down his face. He had not known he had so much emotion in him. Yet, who would have thought the old man to have had so much blood in him? Not this. Not again, please, I've been... Reality blinked and his soul twisted. The razor touched her wrist, slid down and along. Blood flowed freely like running water. Then the other wrist, harder this time. Difficult holding the razor in, in the left hand, especially now. The razor dropped to the floor. Reality blinked and he was standing by the bathtub, looking down at her, her hair floating in a wreath around her pale face. The water had turned a deep shade of red. Claire was gone. Gone. He was alone. He fell to his knees, weeping. I've been so alone, he whispered. So alone. Billy, she said, and reality blinked. He looked up. Now she was standing in front of him. The core rose behind her a dark setting for her pale, wet body. He fell against her, his face burning with the radiant cold from her belly. Pain shook him, tumultuous and terrible. His weeping turned to enormous sobs, grief and terror mingling. She touched his face, her fingers burning, stroking. He looked up. It's all right, she said. It's all right. You'll never be alone again. You're with me now. You're with me and I have such wonderful things to show you. She, ch she touched his cheek. Gently, her cold fingers reached for his eyes. Reality blinked. Weir raised his hands to his eyes. His nails sank into the flesh, tearing, blood streaming down his face. He began to scream, releasing the pain, the anguish, the terror, the rage. I am death, the destroyer of worlds. Exultant, he was reborn. Chapter 44 Cooper hung head down over the ad hoc weld on the baffle plate, making one last check for flaws. As far as he could tell, everything here was just, well, peachy. So he was a perfectionist, and Smith can kiss my happy ass, he thought. Solid as a rock, 
he said aloud. Smith, being a pain in the ass and an intrusion into the sacred space of his helmet, said, How much longer are you going to take, Cooper? I want to get out of here. Cooper sighed. Smith could be such a humorless dork at times. Zip that shit, he said. I'm done. Let me secure my tools. Be two minutes tops. Roger that, Smith said, and cut, and cut the connection. Shithead, Cooper thought sourly. He had better be careful what he had said. In the end, Smith was the one getting them home. Done with Cooper, Smith turned his attention to unloading CO2 scrubbers, wondering where Peters had got off to. If she did not show up soon, he was going to have to go back to the event horizon and find her, and that was something he did not want to do. He saw a movement out of the corner of his eye and turned towards it. Peters, he said, it's about goddamn time. It was Weir, not Peters. Weir had been aboard the Lewis and Clark, probably heading out there when the captain had been calling for them to watch out for the scientist. Figures it would be my watch, Smith thought. He had had his fill of this mission, of that ship, and of Weir. Weir ducked around a corner, head down. In a moment he was into the umbilicus, moving like a madman as soon as he hit microgravity. Weir! Hey, Weir! Smith shouted. Get your ass back on board! Weir! Weir ignored him, spiraling up the length of the umbilicus towards the event horizon. Smith keyed his radio, furious now. He could have happily throttled Weir. Keeping up with the scientist was turning out to be worse than cat herding. Captain, come in. Captain? Smith on the radio, sounding none too happy. The tone of his voice worried Miller. He slowed from the fast jog he had been maintaining along the event horizon's main corridor and found an intercom panel, keying it on. Go ahead, Smith, he said. I just saw Weir messing around on the clock, Smith said. Miller sighed. What the hell is he up to now? Something popped and hissed nearby, and Miller turned his head to see. Overhead, crudely severed, strip wires were touching an exposed electronic circuit shorting out with a small shower of sparks. It looked as though something had been yanked roughly out of that spot. He shook his head, starting to turn back to the intercom. A small box, closer to the floor, caught his eye, the explosive symbol standing out. He turned to the intercom. Smith, get out of there. Come again, Captain? Smith sounded startled. One of the explosives is missing from the corridor. He looked up again. The wiring was still shorting out. Weir could have put it on the clock. Smith took a step back, going cold. That son of a bitch. Get off the clock now and wait for me at the main airlock, Miller said. No, no, we just got it back together, Smith moaned. Get out of there now, Miller snapped. You know I can't do that, Captain, Smith thought, bolting from the airlock and racing into the Lewis and Clark. There would not be much time but maybe there was enough. If he could get the charge out into space, away from the ship, most of the explosive force would be wasted, shrapnel being the only problem then. He ran to the crew quarters, trying to figure out where the scientists could have put the case, ripping open lockers and spilling their contents to the floor. Where is it? He muttered, emptying Peters' locker, sending her vid unit flying, not caring about how much damage he did. Peters could get mad at him later. Where is it? Smith! Miller was yelling at the intercom, but Smith was not answering him. The stupid, crazy bastard. Smith! Fuck! He smashed his fist into the intercom panel, then turned and ran down the corridor, heading for the airlock, heading for his ship. It was going to be too late. He knew it. Smith ploughed on through the Lewis and Clark. He pulled open a storage locker, started to reach in. Something was beeping. I gotcha, he said and started pulling out the contents of the locker. I gotcha. Almost ecstatic, he grabbed a duffel bag that was sitting on the floor, yanking it out. The beeping was louder, clearer. He quickly opened the bag, letting the clothing fall to the floor. The explosive charge was nestled in the clothing like a wicked uncle's idea of an Easter egg. A warning light on top, blinking in time with the beeps, the flashing and beeping, had grown more rapid in the past seconds. The charge was reaching the end of its countdown. The beep stopped, 
A steady tone sounded. Smith sat back, closing his eyes and sighing. No time to prepare to. Miller raced into the airlock bay. Thunder rumbled through the air and he screamed in negation, even as the thunder faded and the wave of heat and light slammed him back into the corridor. Klaxon sounded and he could hear the sound of pressure doors slamming as he tried to pick himself up from the deck. Through the windows, white light had momentarily replaced the blue of Neptune. The explosion was silent in the vacuum, opening out of the Lewis and Clark's midsection like a flower of light. The force of the blast tore the ship into two ragged pieces, the drive section spinning away with fuel trailing and flaring, the forward section beginning a slow tumble as it passed over the event horizon. Cooper clung desperately to a stanchion, praying that none of the shrapnel from the blast would puncture his suit. The event horizon receded into the distance. Miller walked slowly forward, staring through the airlock bay, windows as pieces of the ship tumbled away. Metal shards struck the window, bounced off, leaving no more than minute scratches. The drive section was tumbling into Neptune's atmosphere. He doubted it, was, it would be long before it detonated, providing that enough fuel remained. The nose section had tumbled past the event horizon and out of sight. His ship was dead. His crew was dying. Miller turned and walked slowly to an intercom. He keyed it, turning, so he could see the drive section falling. DJ, he said, his voice soft with grief and rage. What happened? DJ said. The clock's gone. There was a flash of white light. The drive section was disintegrating. Smith and Cooper are dead. It was weird. You see him, you take him out. DJ had finished tidying up in medical, downloading the bed logs and getting his equipment in shape. Now he stood by the intercom, frozen, rage slowly rising as he considered Weir's action. Understood, he said finally. He was capable of killing, especially when the target was murderously insane. Be careful, Miller said. I can take care of Weir, DJ said. He turned around, intending to look for a reasonable weapon. Weir was waiting for him, smiling. His face was covered in dried blood, his eye sockets nothing more than two bloody holes, still oozing a little. DJ started to scream, but Weir's red right hand slammed into his throat, silencing him. Pain flared into his head. There was an odd sound from DJ, muffled by the intercom, something crashing like steel and glass falling to the deck. Weir. DJ kicked, fighting away from Weir, but it was no use. Weir tore at him with terrifying strength. His lack of eyes, no handicap. DJ was picked up, slammed into an examination table, picked up again, sent flying through the air, smashed helplessly into storage cabinets. Weir strode through the carnage, bending down to pick DJ up. The doctor stared up at his tormentor, blood on his lips. Weir smiled. He turned DJ around, pulled back his head. DJ closed his eyes. In a swift, exact motion, Weir cut DJ's throat from ear to ear, letting the blood spray for a few moments. He released the corpse, putting aside the scalpel he had used, and turned his attention to cabinets filled with surgical instruments. From one, he took surgical needles. From another, he took thread. Sitting down to work, he began threading a needle. Miller was still trying to get a response over the intercom. Frantic, he changed the channel, keyed it again. DJ? DJ, come in! The intercom hissed. I told you, Weir said, his voice soft and strange. She won't let you leave. Miller swore and ran out of the airlock bay. Chapter 45 Miller raced through the event horizon, driven beyond exhaustion, knowing that if he survived now, he would pay for his efforts. He reached medical, barely allowed the hash time to open. He stopped staring. DJ, he whispered, staring. Oh God, there was blood everywhere. Trays toppled, instruments scattered. 
DJ had been suspended in a cocoon of bandages and surgical tape, hanging over an operating table at the far end of the medical bay. His throat gaped open. Miller walked closer. DJ's midsection had been open neatly. He had been eviscerated. His organs placed in an orderly fashion on the open surface of the table. Miller fled from medical, his mind blurring. Somewhere he found a tool locker with a nail gun inside. A poor tool overall, but functional enough for killing Weir. Resolution clearing his mind, he set off for the bridge. Cooper figured he was either shaking off the panic and terror, or falling into complete hysteria when it occurred to him that there was surfers back on Earth who would kill to get this sort of ride. Would have curled my hair if it wasn't already. Then he was back in the world, ready to deal with the problem at hand. Smith was gone. That much he knew from the radio transmissions. The crazy bastard had tried to get the bomb off the ship, against Miller's orders. It was, Cooper decided, a mess. The event horizon was in the distance now. The wreckage of the Lewis and Clark's front section had passed over the starship and away from Neptune. The orbit would stabilise eventually, and then start decaying. Given the location of the bomb, he figured that the drive section had been kicked back towards Neptune and was most likely vaporised by now. Time to go. He oriented himself carefully, trying to avoid pushing himself away from the wreckage. His boots clamped firmly to the whole place. First step, or lack of it, he breathed out hard, shaking. He looked at the readout for his air tanks. This was the critical factor now. He was reading one tank full and one tank at half pressure. Relief flooded through him. He could do it. Carefully, he got his backpack pulled around. This was the really tricky part. Working quickly but, but carefully, he closed one of the main valves, shutting off the full tank. The readout flickered and told him he was on, the, on his reserved air supply. He disconnected the hose from the main tank, unhooked it and pulled it out. He eased his backpack into place again. He wrapped himself around the full tank, reaching for the valve as he oriented himself to the receding event horizon. This trick had worked for some people in the space-side training, but not for others. It was popular in the big rock range too, where assorted gases were easy to extract from the asteroids. He opened the valve, cutting his boot magnets off. Air puffed from the valve, misted, liquefied, froze. He began to move towards the event horizon, gathering speed, leaving a crystal trail pointing to where he had been. The remains of the Lewis and Clark spun silently, on. Miller stalked towards the hatchway that led into the bridge, the nail gun feeling hot in his fist. The hatch was open. Slowly he stepped inside, looking left and right. Someone was sitting at the helm, apparently staring out of the main bridge windows. He raised the nail gun, ready to fire. Hesitated. Weir, he said. His voice was flat and dead. No movement. He moved forward slowly ready to open fire with a hail of rivets. He could barely breathe. He moved around the helm position, looking over the nail gun. Not weir. It was stark. Wired into the helm flight chair, legs pulled back, her wrists bound to them, wire wrapped around her throat to keep her head up, though she was unconscious. Blood trickled from her throat where the wire was cutting in. Even in the gloom, Miller could see that she was becoming cyanotic from the slow strangulation. Hold on, he whispered, kneeling down and putting the nail gun on the floor, within reach. Get you out of these. He was going to space the crazy bastard that he swore. Shove him out of the airlock and watch him die in vacuum. Even that was better than, than he deserved. He worked at the wire, cutting his fingers, but managing to undo the binding around her throat. Stark suddenly breathed in, a great painful gasping noise that startled him. He set to work on her arms and her ankles, freeing her, trying to stay aware of the bridge around him. Stark opened her eyes, moved an arm, stared at him, stared past him, her eyes widening. Miller turned, knowing he was too vulnerable. Weir was behind him, appearing with the silence and skill of a ghost. His eyes had been sewn shut, black lines of thread, clumsily zigzagging across his eyelids. Lines of dried blood coated his cheeks and chin, Marty's flight suit, his hands were blood red. Stark lunged sideways, trying for the nail gun. Weir moved like greased lightning, hitting Stark so hard that the navigator was hurtled across the bridge, into a bulkhead, stunning her. 
In the same move, before Miller could do anything about it, Weir snatched up the nail gun, aiming it at Miller's head, then shifted his aim to Miller's right eye. Miller rose, backed away. Your eyes, he whispered. I don't need them anymore, Weir said. His voice was a cracked curiosity, light with perverse humour. The undertone is dark and demonic. This was more than madness, Miller thought. Weir had taken the same road that Kilpack had gone down. Where we're going, we won't need eyes to see. What are you talking about? Miller said. Do you know what the singularity is, Miller? Can you can your mind truly fathom what a black hole is? Sightless, he watched Miller. He smiled slightly. It is nothing. Absolute and eternal nothing. And if God is everything, then I have seen the devil. He grinned broadly, spreading his arms joyfully. It's a liberating experience. The nail gun swung back to point at Miller's eye. Weir reached out with his free hand, tapped pads, flipped a switch, displays lit up. Words appeared on one of the screens, pristine text against the dark background. Gravity drive is now primed. Do you wish to engage? What are you doing? Miller said. You'll see, Weir said. He grinned again, reached out and tapped a key. He lowered the nail gun again, barely paying attention to Miller. New text appeared on the display. Gravity drive engaged. Activation in T minus 10 minutes. A countdown timer appeared, running backwards. Miller started a lunge for the nail gun in Weir's hand. It snapped up again. He backed away carefully. If you miss me, you'll blow out the hole. You'll die too. What makes you think I'll miss? Weir said. He has a point there, Miller thought. Something moved at the edge of the bridge windows. Miller had to work hard to cover his shock. Cooper had just drifted into view, peering into the bridge. Miller could barely believe it. If he could keep Weir distracted. Weir turned so fast that he seemed to blur. The nail gun made a loud spitting sound. A six centimetre nail struck the thick quartz glass of the bridge windows, buried up to the head. A web of minute cracks radiated out from the impact point. Miller could hear the glass creaking. Weir seemed oblivious to the effects of what he was doing. He stepped towards the window, the nail gun held out. Cooper suddenly vanished from the window, leaving behind a crystalline trail. Miller almost smiled. Cooper was a resourceful cuss, that was for sure. Miller turned and ran, diving for the door, hitting the deck and rolling through. Behind him there was the sound of the nail gun firing, and the smack of a nail going into the window. Miller turned around, rising. Weir turned to look at Miller. The bridge window shattered, the pieces pouring outward with the atmosphere of the bridge. A gale plucked at Miller, trying to take him from his feet. He managed to grab hold of the door frame, pinning himself in place. Weir was picked up by the rush of escaping atmosphere, slammed into the helm console, and bounced up towards the shattered window as he flailed, trying to grab hold of something, the nail gun falling from his hand and flying out of the window. Miller's nose was beginning to bleed. The pressure door was moving. Weir spread out like a starfish, somehow getting hold of the shattered edges of the bridge window, heedless of the glass chopping into his hands. He started to haul himself back inside, bloody ice forming on his hands and face. One of the less secure bridge monitors ripped free of his mountings. Sailing towards the window, slamming into Weir's midriff, the scientist flailed wildly, trying to regain his grip but it was too late. Trailing bloody crystals, Weir vanished. Stark was conscious again, clinging to the side of a console, losing her battle against the outrushing atmosphere. The event horizon had a lot of atmosphere to dump. Come on, he yelled to Stark, hoping his voice would carry. I, I can't, she shouted back. Her hands were slipping and she was gasping for air, blood starting to stream from her nose. Miller turned, grabbing the first almost loose item that he saw, some kind of compressor unit, just outside the bridge. With a yell of desperation, he yanked it loose, slamming it down into the path of the pressure door, straddling it, and putting a hand on the door to help it keep it propped open. He leaned into the bridge, holding his other hand out to Stark. Give me your hand, he screamed. Your hand! Stark lunged towards him, reaching out. He closed his hand around hers. The temperature was dropping rapidly, 
cold enough now to form a layer of ice on their arms. Their veins were bulging as the pressure continued to drop. He did not want to think about the level of capillary damage they were both experiencing. The door jerked forward in its track, pushing him, crumbling the compressor slightly. The door! Stark yelled. It will cut you in half. Let go! Let me go! I'm not leaving you! Miller yelled, and he hauled back with all the strength he had left, pulling her back with him into the corridor. As she came, she kicked the compressor, loosening it. Stark fell on top of him, screaming, and he rolled desperately, trying to get them up against the wall. The compressor pulled free, flew towards the window. The pressure door slammed shut, almost taking Miller's boot heel. The winds died down. Miller gasped for breath, cradling Stark. They were alive, battered and half-frozen, but they had made it and we had not. In the depths of the ship, a klaxon began to sound. Chapter 46 The forward airlock, Miller said. His lungs hurt beyond belief, drowning the pains in the rest of his body. Stark looked like hell. They got to their feet, making the best speed they could to airlock bay 4, deep in the nose of the ship. It could be Cooper, but there was no way of knowing yet. He had no idea what Weir might be capable of. For all they knew, he might consider an involuntary, unsuited spacewalk to be no more than light-hearted fun. They ran into the airlock bay, coming to a stop. The dim light was no help, and the flashing light inside the airlock did nothing but confuse things. All Miller could see was a humanoid shape moving slowly as it came in. Miller crossed the bay, opening a tool cabinet, taking down a zero-g bolt cutter. He made a more than adequate bludgeon. It can't be him, Stark said. I'm not taking any chances, Miller said, hefting the bolt cutter as he walked towards the airlock. Stay behind me. The airlock hissed open abruptly. Cooper tumbled in frantically, trying to remove his helmet. Cooper, Stark shouted. She ran to him, opened the clasp, pulling his helmet off. He bent double, his hands on his knees as he took a deep breath of the dank air and started coughing. He straightened up, trying for another deep breath. Let me breathe, he gasped. Let me breathe. Cooper must have been down to the wire when he started back, Miller realised. You're okay now, Stark said. It's over. It's not over, Miller said. Stark turned, following Miller's look. A workstation was active. A display flashing. Gravity drive engaged. Activation 00064301. We're activated the drive. We've got to shut it down. Cooper glanced at the workstation, looked back at Weir. Oh, the bridge. The bridge is gone, Stark said. What about engineering? Miller gave her a hard look. Can you shut it down? I don't know the process, Stark said angrily. Dr. Weir was the expert. I don't want to go where the last crew went, Cooper said, giving Miller an unwavering look. I'd rather be dead. Then we blew the fucker up, Miller said. Blow it up, Stark said, staring at him as though he had followed Weir into the mouth of madness. Miller went over to the workstation and others following. He keyed in commands, pulling up a schematic of the ship, pointing. We blew the corridor. Like Weir said, use the four decks as a lifeboat, separated from the rest of the ship. We stay put. And the gravity drive goes where no man has gone before, Cooper said, his eyes narrowing. He did not smile. Chapter 47 They entered the gravity couch bay at a trot. Justin was still floating comfortably in his tank, unperturbed by the recent events. Miller was grateful for that. Justin had been spared some of its insanity. Miller stopped and turned. You prep the gravity couches. I'm going to manually arm those explosives. Will this shit work? Cooper said. It worked for where? Miller said. He doubted anyone was in the mood for ironic comments. Prep the tanks. Stark stepped towards him. I'll go with you. Just get those tanks ready. He said, moving toward the hatchway. He nodded at the hatch. Close it behind me, just in case. Stark stared at Miller for a long moment, as though trying to burn his face into a memory. Miller, be right back, he said, attempting a reassuring, confident tone, 
and knowing that he was failing miserably. He smiled, knowing it to be false, and stepped through the hatch. She stared at him for a moment longer, then reached to her right. The hatch closed with a dull sound, and he was alone. He took a deep breath and ran. He made it to the central corridor in record time, hurtling along it as though trying to break every sprinting record in the book. Reaching a coupling, he dropped quickly to one knee, reaching down to pop the catches on the cover of an explosive charge. He lifted the cover off. There was an unlit indicator on the charge, and a single switch. One of the switch positions was labelled manual, in bold letters. Leaving the cover off, he went to the next charge, repeating the process, hurrying as much as he dared. They were almost out of time. Okay, Slashaholics, this has been chapters 43, 44, 45, 46, and 47, the penultimate narration by Liam Anderson of Event Horizon, the novelization. Uh, hell of a little cliffhanger there. Uh, the next upload of this book will be the final chapters, and then I will release an unabridged version of the audiobook as well. Big thank you to Liam Anderson for narrating this one. Be sure to thank him in the comments section. He's working hard on this. He's doing a great job. I really love the little line the author threw in there, in the mouth, Into the Mouth of Madness, a little Sam Neill reference there. Um, I'm curious to see how it all ties up. We'll be back very soon with the conclusion of Event Horizon. Until then, thank you for listening. Be excellent to each other, and we'll see you soon.